Rapport with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. <laughs> And I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Tuesday, February 21st, 2023. My name is Emma Vigeland, in for Sam Cedar, and this is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Joanna Schwartz, professor of law at UCLA and author of Shielded, How the Police Became Untouchable. And later in the show, Sam Mellons, senior reporter at New York Focus, will be joining us to discuss the embarrassing end of the New York judge fight for Governor Hathi Hochul. Kathy Hochul. Hochul. Hacky. Hathi Hochul. Hacky. Hathi Hochul. Oh, baby. Oh, and also featured the construction outside. Meanwhile, just two weeks after the earthquakes that killed tens of thousands, another quake hits Turkey and Syria. At least six have died that we know of. China has denied the Biden administration's claims that it is considering providing arms to Russia. Who knows? And after Biden's meeting with Zelensky in Kiev, Putin announced that he will begin withdrawing from the 2011 START nuclear uh, non-proliferation agreement, the last remaining arms treaty with the U.S. and Russia. I mean, we need a global, global movement behind denuclearization of, of weaponry. Biden is also meeting with the uh, right-wing president of Poland today, Andrzej Duda. The extremist bills attacking the Israeli judiciary have passed their initial hurdles in the Knesset and are one step closer to becoming law. Oral arguments begin today on the Supreme Court case involving Section 230, which could change the legal liabilities for tech companies and their algorithms. After environmental groups threatened legal action against the Department of Transportation, Buttigieg is doing... something? Track inspections and, and a study to see if new braking systems should be required, like the ones uh, under the, results the Obama are in. administration? <laughs> we just did a study in East Palestine, and uh, yes, we need those things. Yeah. <laughs> it's like as conclusive as, as it gets. God. Can we get that in uh, multiple choice next time? <laughs> <sighs> Ohio has been hit with another blow. At least one dead and 13 injured in a metal factory explosion. House Republicans are reintroducing legislation attacking the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. What else is new? A new study finds that deaths in state and federal prisons increased nearly 50% during the first year of COVID, and that's more than twice the increase in the rest of the country. And lastly, DeSantis's pre-presidency tour begins with a crime focus. He's headed off to New York, Illinois, and Pennsylvania, and Trump apparently going to East Palestine, or so he says. That would be before Biden. All this and more on today's Majority Report. Welcome to the show, everybody. Apologies if you hear this construction outside. Like, it is just rain. It's, it's thunderous, but it's, it's a jackhammer and it's like shaking the entire building. So uh, hopefully that subsides uh, in a little bit. But, but if you do hear that... It's just just uh, nothing we can do about it, New unfortunately. Yeah, I mean, I'm like, it was making me very ornery in my reading. I'm like, 
I'm sensitive to to temperature, to sounds. I'm just a little baby. We need to get Emma like a sort of uh, uh, isolation tank that she, so she can just uh, unload all this information mm -hmm. in a, a hyperbaric your, chamber. Exactly. Yeah. You're yeah. right. And then uh, my voice can just be uh, communicated through artificial intelligence. It'd be like uh, in Minority Report, just floating in one of those vats. And then, that would then be apt. Us the news. Yeah. yeah. Um, and also, you know, just kind of like interesting branding for us. Um, well, become a member, and then you can fund my sem sensory deprivation chamber. We'll be doing experiments on the first uh, batch. We got a uh, new one from SpaceX. So we're <laughs> <laughs> oh, fingers crossed. Um, let's uh, let's let's talk uh, a bit about uh, Biden's visit to Kiev. But I guess it ties into the other big news story here, which is East Palestine. Um, here's Tucker Carlson uh, on his program last night. Speaking about Biden's surprise visit to Ukraine, uh, where he met with Zelensky in in tandem with the announcement that the uh, that the the U.S. government will be providing five hundred million dollars more in uh, military aid, which is you know just a, kind of a continuous flow of arms. I mean, it's understandable to like a certain extent, um, and obviously the invasion of of. Uh, Ukraine is an act of imperialism um, and one that we should strongly oppose if you're actually, you know, anti-war. But yeah. um, it, I mean, it's just. But I mean, I think the Quincy Institute people, all the, like like those sorts of folks are, and Chomsky, like they're all right when they say you need to gear this. All this needs to be toward a uh, negotiated peace somehow. Yes. Like that's the only way this ends, and uh, we need to be doing more toward that. Yeah. Um, and and so I think that's like in the bubble or the pot of legitimate critique. Um, but then there's also the critique of optics. Right. And if Trump actually does what he says he's going to do on Truth Social and there's not a lot of truth that comes out in Truth Social, but he's it's claiming that note. he's it is. But there's a lot of humor. He's claiming that he's going to go to East Palestine, uh, Ohio soon. Um, so if Trump beats Biden there, I don't like that, especially in, in, in when you pair it with Buttigieg's kind of, uh, cold in action, you know, consultant speak when really confronted with this. So there's no contest on which party would be more beneficial to, you know, environmental protections, but the political optics of this are not good, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, Pete said he'll get there when the time is right, whatever that means. And, you know, Trump, like, uh, people will make the correct point that his administra administration rolled back the Obama air safety regulations um, on high hazard cargo trains. That rule wouldn't have applied to this one because uh, it wasn't marked high hazard. This is just a general, like, corporate uh, um, uh lack of uh, investment Parsing. problem well yeah and i mean it's also just i feel like a bit semantics to a degree like we're talking about general that's one rule that we didn't that we that right. he got rid of for the exact same reason that biden crushed the strike yes <laughs> It's so, all because of these uh, rail oligarchs control these both these parties. They do. Um, and and I, I think that this is a missed opportunity for the Biden administration to parse to to uh, illustrate the differences, though. I mean, there are. Yes, they're they're both bought and paid for. But one is better. And right now there's a vacuum being left politically. But here's Tucker Carlson kind of giving his spin on that weeks ago and the Biden administration responded to it and the mushroom cloud that resulted when officials set fire to the wreckage by saying that calm down these kind of environmental disasters happen all the time the transportation secretary mayor Pete told us we have a thousand train derailments a year don't worry that's not exactly reassuring but at least since Biden became president it does appear to be true these things are happening a lot. It's not your imagination. Whoa. Just today, there was a mass casualty event in Bedford, Ohio, after a metal manufacturing plant exploded. That's about an hour away from East Palestine. Multiple victims were reported burned. What was that about? We don't know. Meanwhile, in Doral, Florida, residents have been told to shelter in place for more than a week after a, quote, renewable energy plant caught fire back on February 12th. According to the EPA, air quality reached unhealthy levels after the fire began. Local parks and schools have closed. Residents are still being told to close their windows and run their air conditioners. That's still the guidance from local officials tonight after emergency workers tore down what's left of the 
renewable energy plant. Residents in Osceola County, Florida, meanwhile, near Orlando, have been receiving similar guidance after a massive fire at a plant there burned thousands of plastic pots and pallets last week. Now, the Biden administration hasn't said anything about any of these. What is this? At some point, people are going to ask, is this industrial sabotage or some kind of war going on? OK, OK. This so is this administ- is where, like, again, I mean, he, he begins with some sort of pressure point that he can put his, you know, he can there's a wound and he's just sticking his thumb in there. Right. And and p- for for political value, it makes sense. Right. Uh, as I've said, I am I think there is valid criticism about how the Biden administration is, is leaving so much dead air on this very topic. And, and, and Buttigieg has been a disaster. But he goes down a conspiratorial lane because when you actually dive into what regulations mean, there's one party that's in favor of at least some regulations and the other is uniformly in favor of dismantling the administrative state and regulation efforts. And so it has to be like, what's going on here? I mean, I'm go- I, he, he began with two examples in Ohio. OK, now we're bouncing around the country and it's just like, I'm just asking questions. It's a conspiracy angle. And the idea that like it, he, he does, he says something there that like this, this is why he's you know, get paid the big bucks to be a, you know, fascist uh, a propagandist. Because the way he says, at least under the Biden administration, these things happen all the time, at least under the Biden administration. You look at ac- the actual data and, like, it, it's, these things happen all the time pre-Biden as well. <laughs> like, yes. Like, right, like, that is an, an insane, like, thing to say that all of a sudden, uh, because of the election train started, um, uh, being derailed, which, by the way, if that was true, I would look at like <laughs> the right wing, the people who like stormed the Capitol. But anyway, that's not the case. Actually, this is a fairly common thing. The East Palestine one was dramatic, had amazing video, and like a poison cloud. Uh, right after a movie about a poison cloud came out, like yeah. the, the con- conditions are right, and there's like all like, I mean, th- that's the create like that is such a lie. It's such a lie, and and and. He has to make it about something nefarious and asking questions about, you know, uh, government conspiracy because the the his audience is not interested in government red tape that pre- would prevent these kinds of of safety concerns. Isn't at abolishing the EPA and, like an article of faith of these guys? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, but the but the 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 premise of like his analysis and what he's trying to speak to, you, you can't touch that because mm-hmm. that's the, really the answer here. But let's keep going uh, th- down this rabbit hole. He hasn't said anything about any of these. What is this? At some point, people are going to ask, is this industrial sabotage or some kind of war going on? This is the administration that blew up the most important natural gas pipeline in the world. There we go. Linking East and Western Europe. The Biden people did that. Is this related to that in somehow, some way? We don't know, by the way, but why wouldn't you ask that at a certain point? But they don't care. Biden okay, I'm just like you- think, think about this logically. Why would the you know the claims made by by uh, by Seymour Hirsch? Why would that be in any way actually connected here to the United States and in, and domestic sabotage? That yeah. was within the confines of the United States supporting Ukraine against their inv- Russia invading them, right? Um, and and this is what he's trying to make a connection to. But there's there's no logical one. To make yeah, it. I, like unless Cy Hirsch has a new piece coming out saying Biden intentionally derailed the train, um, which I like ridiculous to think that that again. Tim Pool saying Antifa did. Yeah, exactly. Until he until he did the. But this is the only this is the only thing that these guys have right because they can't touch regulation, they can't touch red tape, they can't touch more oversight on capitalists on industry. It's all some big conspiracy to distract you from the real stuff. Here we go. Crane tonight telling Zelensky whatever you want we will give you while thousands of American cities in several American citizens in several cities are being exposed to chemicals that could over time kill them. So you have to ask the question, where did that one trillion dollars in infrastructure money go? We'd really like to know. We we do know. We do know. It's currently uh 
being uh, it's currently being put into projects. We just had Kowalski uh, write in yesterday saying that um, that he's seeing some of that money actually get invested into certain infrastructure. That bill passed last year. It's been less than the calendar year. So those projects are happening now. Uh, didn't go anywhere scary, Tucker Carlson. That's your answer. Well, I mean, what that is, is that's how they switch this into an austerity thing to say that actually that spending, which was way too meager, uh, mm -hmm. way less than it should have been, um, uh, and had to be uh, done under the cover of an infrastructure reduction thing. That should have been way larger. Inflation. Inflation yeah. reduction. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, uh, but like both him and JD Vance, they have to like kind of set the table of, oh no, they wasted taxpayer money mm -hmm. to do that to like boondoggles and like you know how they used to do Solyndra and all these things under Obama. So, like that's the good old fashioned GOP politics there underneath the um, you know uh, use of conspiracies. Yeah, and of course, as as I've been reiterating, nothing um, more more uh, character. Uh, <laughs> Nothing that speaks more to the character of the conservative movement than also a complete aversion to talking about regulation and the oversight of capitalists and industry that would have prevented uh, this. Yeah, this is like this is very um, libertarian friendly view of the world. Like it's not it was the government that did this. The poor train companies like they're they're being used as pawns mm -hmm. in a game they don't understand. Uh, poor no Norfolk Southern. All right, we're going to take a quick break, but first we have a word from two of our favorite sponsors, two of our favorite sponsors. You know, Shopify, it is the commerce platform revolutionizing millions of businesses worldwide, whether it's, you know, the T-shirts that we have here at the Majority Report or something in your small business, a small shop that you're trying to get out there for the public to see, it makes it super easy. Shopify simplifies selling online and in person so you can focus on successfully growing your business. Shopify covers every sales channel from in-person POS systems to on an all-in-one e-commerce platform. It even lets you sell across social media marketplaces like TikTok, Facebook, and Instagram. It just makes it super easy, consolidated uh, with Shopify. Packed with industry-leading tools ready to ignite your growth, Shopify gives you the complete control over your business and your brand without having to learn any new skills in design or code. And thanks to 24-7 help and an extensive business course library, Shopify is there to support your success every step of the way. Now it's your turn to get serious about selling and try Shopify today. Now, we've said this before. Uh, this is the, the Majority Report merch, the cool merch you can buy uh, with us. It's all powered by Shopify. So it's made it super easy for Sam where I will say that kind of stuff doesn't necessarily come naturally to him. Uh, I'll put that out there. And Shopify's made it easy for him. So this is possibility powered by Shopify. Uh, sign up for a $1 per month trial period. That is a small figure. $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash majority, M-A-J-O-R-I-T-Y. And that's Shopify, S-H-O-P-I-F-Y dot com slash majority go to shopify.com slash majority to take your business to the next level today shopify.com slash majority and lastly you know 2023 we're already in february we're nearing the end of february wow time's going going fast but you don't want to wait any longer to uh level up your small business and set yourself up for success or you know hey if you're uh running behind you don't have the time to go to the po post office stamps.com it helps out everybody small business or just regular people get ahead of the competition by using stamps.com to mail and ship stamps.com lets you print out your own postage and shipping labels right from your house or uh or your home or your office super easy stamps.com has postage rates you can literally not find anywhere else like up to 84% off USPS and UPS. 84%. For 25 years, Stamps.com has been indispensable for over 1 million businesses. And you can sell products online. Uh, if, uh, and if you sell products online, rather. Stamps.com seamlessly connects with every major marketplace and shopping cart. Use Stamps.com to print postage. Wherever you do business, all you need is a computer and a printer. They even send you a free scale. So you can do that yourself, too. 
Set your business up for success when you get started with Stamps.com today. Sign up with promo code Majority Report. Majority Report, no space, for a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus free postage and that free digital scale. No long-term commitments or contracts. Go to Stamps.com, click the microphone at the top of the page, and enter code Majority Report, no space, uh, Stamps.com providing you with all you need for mailing and shipping. All right, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we'll be joined by Joanna Schwartz. We're back and we are joined uh, now by Joanna Schwartz, who is a, uh, a law professor at UCLA, and the book is called Shielded, How the Police Became Untouchable. Uh, Joanna, thanks so much for coming on. Thanks so much for having me. Of course. So uh, you open your book in Atlanta uh, in the introduction, and that's been in the news for cop-related, police-related reasons recently because of the construction of Cop City the uh, the the demonstrations and and the the protest against it um and you tell the story of Henri Norris who was a 78 year old grandfather who had this encounter with police it was not a lethal encounter right but still a hor- horrifying one why did you make the the choice to start with that story as opposed to you know some of the more well known uh infamous stories of police brutality uh, in this country I actually fill my book with stories of people who you likely have not heard of before. And that is for a reason. Uh, The cases that garner national and international attention are cases where there's a lot of public pressure uh, to get justice for the victims of misconduct. And in those cases, often justice of some sort is is quickly uh, given to the the victims and their families. But the place, uh, the the kinds of cases that I'm really focused on are the cases that don't get public attention. And those really are the cases where the various kinds of barriers that the Supreme Court and state and local governments have uh, created uh, that make it very difficult for those people to seek justice. And so I start the story with, with one of those people, Uh, His name is Henri Norris. As you mentioned, he was sitting at home watching the news, uh, as he did most nights, when a group of over a dozen police officers stormed into his home. They were looking for a drug dealer and had a warrant for a house that was uh, 30 yards away and looked nothing like his home. But they came into his home anyway, busted down the doors, uh, handcuffed him, put him to the floor, ignored his uh, calls for help. He had uh, heart trouble and uh, and he was double the age of the person they were looking for, but uh, was mistreated nonetheless. And when he wanted justice through the system, there was no chance that uh, the officers were going to be prosecuted. They weren't they weren't disciplined by the department. And so really the kind of justice that he could get was through a civil suit seeking money against the officers who had broken into his home and scared him to death. Well, and and, and the problem, and I apologies if you hear this construction in the background, I can't tell if that's getting picked up, but- um, I don't hear it. Okay, good. Um, well, I mean, you know, so- what ended up kind of preventing him from from getting justice? I mean, it's 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 qualified immunity. I know a lot of people in our audience have probably heard that term, but what is qualified immunity? Qualified immunity is what 
closed the courthouse doors for Henri Norris. And it's a legal protection for officers, even when they have violated the Constitution, if they haven't violated what's referred to by the Supreme Court as clearly established law. And I talk in the book about the development of qualified immunity over the years since it was first announced by the Supreme Court in 1967. The protections have gotten stronger and stronger with each passing year, such that Today, even when an officer has violated the Constitution, they are protected so long as there's not a prior court decision from the Supreme Court or a court of appeals holding that virtually identical conduct is unconstitutional. And in Henri Norris's case, there actually was a prior court decision that had very similar facts where officers had gone without a warrant into someone's home and then held that person at gunpoint. In that prior case, the court did say that the conduct was unconstitutional, but in Henri Norris's case, they still dismissed his claims against the officers because the decision in that prior case was unpublished, meaning it exists uh, online. It's something that I have read and others have read, but it's not formally published in the law books. And so according to uh, that court's rules, the unpublished decision couldn't clearly establish the law. So he was denied relief. And as one additional layer of injustice, Henri Norris's case, the decision in Henri Norris's case wasn't published either. So the law is clearly, it's still not clearly established in that in that area. Well, well, let's go through the history then of some of the case law that led us to this point, right? Because, I mean, your book is very much focused on the power of civil litigation and what that could mean for, for policing in this country. Um, but we don't have that because of a current standard that was set I mean, it, there's a, a lot of focus on the, the case Monell uh, versus Department of Social Services, but it really started much earlier than that with something called Section 1983 in the Ku Klux Klan Act birthed out of Reconstruction, which is a topic that we, we cover a lot on this show. Um, take us through that history, uh, if you don't mind. Sure. It's a really interesting and important history, I think, in context to understand where we are today. Uh, in the Reconstruction after the Civil War, Congress enacted what they referred to as the Ku Klux Klan Act, also sometimes referred to as the Civil Rights Act, which was intended to provide a ability to sue for constitutional violations in federal court. And it was inspired by the rise of the Ku Klux Klan and other white uh, supremacist groups that were torturing and killing black Americans with uh, law enforcement officers either participating in the violence or standing idly by. And the notion was that there needed to be a federal forum, a place, a federal court uh, case that could be brought. At the time, in many state courts, black uh, people were not even allowed to testify. So it was hardly uh, likely that they were going to get justice through the state system. And so when that law was enacted in 1871, uh, the Ku Klux Klan Act, which then became referred to as Section 1983 for the place where it sits in the United States Code, uh, that held the promise of providing justice for people whose rights had been violated. But very quickly, the Supreme Court uh, issued a number of decisions that essentially made Section 1983 powerless, and claims were very rarely brought and never successful uh, in almost the next century. It wasn't until 1961, uh, in a case called Monroe versus Pape, that the Supreme Court first recognized that uh, people could sue government officials, in that case, police officers, for violating the Constitution. And then it wasn't until 1978 when the Supreme Court ruled that local governments, under a case called Monell, local governments could also be sued for the constitutional violations of their officers. So, I mean, the, that that period after the passage of the Civil Rights Act and then the kind of immediate blowback due to, you know, the, the, the failure to see reconstruction through and the Supreme Court becoming radicalized. Right. I mean, it, they uh, what Plessy is how many 20 years, 25 years after after that. 
um, where, you know, uh, upholding the legality of, of segregation. I mean, h- how quick was that turnaround and that uh, attempt to, to limit civil rights uh, in the wake of the Civil War, uh, particularly when it came to, you know, the ability of, of black people who would experience a civil rights violation to get recourse in any any way? It was rapid, and it was uh, really a, a series of Supreme Court decisions that limited the interpretation of the 14th Amendment, limited uh, the kinds of uh, violations, constitutional violations that could be remedied through the statute. As you mentioned with Plessy versus Ferguson, the Supreme Court essentially authorized uh, uh segregation and discrimination. Uh, And so it was a a pretty quick turn. Um, Then in the the 1910s, teens, 20s, 30s, 40s, uh, there became uh, sort of the growth of what became the civil rights movement, pressure back on governments and, and back on the Supreme Court to take a firmer stand, um, which they ultimately did as far as Section 1983 was concerned in 1961. But then in the years following the recognition that Section 1983 could be used to vindicate constitutional rights, the Supreme Court really stepped back from uh, that those protections again, almost almost mirroring what they did following passage of the Ku Klux Klan Act during Reconstruction. And in decision after decision, the Supreme Court cut away at the ability to vindicate people's constitutional rights through Section 1983 with doctrines like qualified immunity and many others. And one, an important point I try to make in the book is, although a lot of attention recently has been on qualified immunity, there really are a whole host of protections that prevent people from getting justice in the courts. Uh, I want to turn to the the sixties and and the uh, the reaffirmation and then the rollback. But I I really loved also your your emphasis in the book on what policing was like during say you know the the nineteenth uh, and twentieth centuries, but really the nineteenth century as well. Like how these Southern police squads were really just came out of of slave patrols, and then in in places like Texas. Um, Texas Rangers uh, being the, the the groups that eventually became policing organizations um, responsible for killing indigenous people, Mexicans, um, and and just, you know, how w- you can't understand policing, especially in that part of the country, although, of course, it's racist throughout the country, without understanding how these organizations came to be out of literally the most racist kind of gangs of people that there could be in those regions. Absolutely. And I think understanding where we are today as a country also requires looking to the past and looking to uh, the inception of, of law enforcement. And I think it's, uh, it's an interesting and important story to know that there is not just one uh, one creation story for law enforcement in our country. It really did come from a variety of, of different um, uh, parts of the country. It, law enforcement uh, arose in, in different ways. As you mentioned, in the South, it was slave patrols. Uh, in, the, in the Southwest, uh, in Texas, it was the Texas Rangers. In the North, um, the the New York Police Department was really modeled on the Metropolitan Police Department in the UK. Mm-hmm. Um, but with those different origin stories, I think that you can still see a, a theme, which is uh, that law enforcement, no matter where it began in our country, um, has been given a great deal of authority to uh, impose their power on the most powerless uh, in our society. Um, mm-hmm. Black people in the South 
uh, indigenous and Mexican and Mexican Americans in the in Texas and and the surrounding regions. In the north, it was immigrants, uh, it was laborers, and so it, in in the country, uh, de, no matter no matter where uh, you look, policing has really been marked with subjugation, uh, racial subjugation, and subjugation of the least powerful. How much of this, too, is the fact that our Constitution and its all all its infinite wisdom uh, never really had uh, federal um, protections or uh, I'm not sure the word I'm looking for, but like a, a statute on um, policing federally. It was essentially left to states and municipalities. I mean, is that as somebody who's a, a legal scholar and, and a law professor, is that one of the things that you see as hamstringing? our ability to, to curb police brutality from a federal level? I do think that the intense localization of law enforcement uh, creates a lot of problems. And if you look at policing across the country, there's almost 18,000 law enforcement agencies, many of whom just have one, two, three uh, officers. And uh, there's very little uh, federal oversight little requirement uh, that there be um, any data collected about policing uh, and provided to the federal government. We saw in recent years uh, that the federal government doesn't even have good data about the number of people killed by police each year uh, and far less information about other kinds of misconduct in which officers engage. There are limited requirements for accrediting officers, limited uh, requirements for um, educating them, training them, disciplining them, uh, limited standards for when officers can be decertified so that they can't uh, hold a law enforcement job anywhere. And these are all areas where I think uh, a greater federal presence would be would be valuable, would be useful, but it is an area that uh, the federal government has been reluctant to intervene in. And as a matter of constitutional structure, uh, there are difficulties in the federal government trying to impose those regulations uh, because it's really not something that's that's recognized in the constitution. There have been efforts by tying federal funding to those kinds of improvements that have been considered and were considered as part of the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. Uh, but I do think more federal control uh, would would improve our system somewhat. So so let's turn to uh, the the standard that you were kind of dis uh, discussing earlier, the Monroe v. Pape case in, in 1961, and then the, the kind of chipping away at the the attempt at at, at bringing back some sort of ability for uh, people to to get recourse uh, from police. Um, take us through how the modern standard that we apply to these um, the, the these issues of police brutality kind of happened in in Supreme Court case law. Absolutely. So there there are a number of different ways in which the Supreme Court's decisions have chipped away at that right to sue. Uh, one of those is qualified immunity doctrine, which uh, protects uh, officers even when they have violated the constitution, if they can't, if there isn't a prior court decision with nearly identical facts, and that has gotten a lot of attention. But there are other Supreme Court decisions that have a large impact as well. Uh, consider the Supreme Court's decisions that just interpret what the Fourth Amendment to the United States Constitution means. That is a protection against unreasonable searches and seizures. But the way in which the Supreme Court has interpreted that language of the Fourth Amendment, police can stop and frisk um, someone walking down the street, stop their car uh, and search their car for, for really almost no reason at all. Uh, the court has described there needs to be a reasonable suspicion, but the way in which they've interpreted it uh, allows that officers can, can make those stops on a pretext based on race, based on ethnicity, so long as they can come up with a justification afterward uh, for the stop itself. Um, there's similar uh, latitude given to police when it comes to use of force. 
police can uh, shoot someone, assault someone uh, who has done nothing wrong, who does not have a weapon, even, even uh, who is holding their hands up in the air so long as the officer says after the fact, I feared for my life. If they have a uh, reasonable concern uh, that force is going to be used against them, they can use force themselves. And it's so, these standards are so vague uh, that it really does give police tremendous power. Uh, I talk in the book about 11 different uh, protections, but I guess I'll, I'll say I'll, I'll offer one more, which is uh, protections against local governments. Um, in the private sector, employers are directly responsible for their employees' misconduct. But the Supreme Court has said that local governments are not directly responsible, that they can only be sued for a pattern or practice of constitutional violations. And the court has made that standard very difficult to meet. So even in extremely troubled police departments, like the one I profile in Vallejo, California, mm. uh, where officers have bent badges in celebration of police shootings and no officers uh, have been disciplined or terminated for their conduct, courts still have found that the city of Vallejo uh, is not or cannot be held responsible because the plaintiffs cannot prove a pattern of past constitutional violations. That's incredible because the amount of violations that you detail in your book, um, I mean, you just gave an anecdote there, but if you don't mind just speaking about Vallejo in particular, because that's such an extreme example of what you're talking about. It is an extreme example. And it's a, a small-ish city uh, near Oakland, California, with about 120,000 people and about 100 officers. And I really focus on the period between 2010 and 2020. Uh, during that decade, police officers in Vallejo killed more people per capita than all but uh, one St. Louis of the 100 largest jurisdictions in the country. And uh, I looked at lawsuits filed during that period of time. I came up with 85 of them. And again and again, you hear or read stories by people who had egregious force uh, against them after they had been arrested, when they were handcuffed, uh, they were tased and they were beaten, they were kicked. Uh, I focus on a story of a man named Mario Romero who was killed uh, by a police officer in Vallejo after his car was stopped, uh, allegedly because the car looked like uh, another car that had been involved with a crime. Mario Romero hadn't been involved in any crime. But uh, he was shot more than 30 times in his car. And in fact, one of the officers uh, had to reload his weapon, got up on the hood of the car and continued shooting Mario Romero. And Jesus. Mario was one of three people that that same officer killed in a matter of months in 2012. And yet when the family of Mario Romero brought this lawsuit against the city of Vallejo, alleging that they had a pattern of horrific misconduct. I should say this officer not only wasn't disciplined, he was promoted uh, and then left the department after a few years to run his own police training uh, business. Oh, that's good. <laughs> but well, uh, I'm sorry. I just like that. He's standing on the hood of the car like he's in Grand Theft Auto and he's, you know, make, he thinks he's he's like the Punisher or something like that. And he has his own training, training uh, apparatus. I mean, this is why it's it's not just training. It's like defunding and then also the ability to, to actually have civil, civil litigation. I just have to say that that's that's what makes this is. This is so systemic, but but I apologize. Keep and going. And it is no, it's it it is systemic, and and it is important to see this not just as a problem of that officer who clearly was acting in a way that would be unimaginable to many law enforcement officers, uh, e even. Uh, but it was a product of a larger culture of the department where officers could get a celebratory badge bending uh, ritual after fatally shooting someone and no one was disciplined. This is a problem that goes not to the individual officers or not alone to the individual officers, but to the entire 
city, the jurisdiction. And this is why it's so important to be able to bring cases directly against the city, to hold the city responsible for the department that it funds. And even though all of these cases, so many cases had been brought, 85 by my count in a decade against this department, and a small group of judges were hearing all of these cases, um, it was still not enough under the law that the Supreme Court has uh, authored, it was not enough to hold the city responsible because the plaintiff couldn't prove that the prior shootings were unconstitutional. So there wasn't a pattern of prior unconstitutional conduct that would put the police chief on notice that he needed to do something different. I, so in terms of municipal liability, right? I mean. Is there any credibility to the claims that municipalities wouldn't have the deep the deep enough pockets to withstand these lawsuits? Pretty sure the answer is no. Um, I mean, in the Breonna Taylor case, I mean, was that different? Because I know that her family did get a settlement. Um, but but uh, if you don't mind, uh, yeah, expanding on that. Yeah. So there are a lot of large settlements and judgments that we hear about um, in the news. Um, and when those settlements are uh, against a smaller jurisdiction, um, you know, it will eat up a larger part of that jurisdiction's budget, um, or more likely in, in really smaller jurisdictions, it will be an insurance provider that, that provides uh, the payouts in those cases. But in the vast majority of cases, particularly cases that that uh, that don't um, get that kind of public attention. The settlements and judgments are much smaller. And in cities and, and counties across the country that I studied, I found that payouts in these cases tend to amount to less than 1% of local government's budgets. And, and usually it is the local government's budget, not the police department's budget. Um, that is being affected by these payouts. And if you compare uh, this less than 1% in police misconduct payouts to the quarter or third of uh, local government budgets that are spent on the police department's budget as a whole, uh, I think it's really misguided to criticize payouts in police misconduct suits as potentially bankrupting jurisdictions when they really are a very small piece of the pie, and especially when there are many people whose rights are violated who get no vindication in the courts at right. all because of limitations like qualified immunity, among others. Yeah, that was really more of a devil's advocate uh, question. Um, lastly here, I, I, is there value in your eyes in you know not trying to, I guess, circumvent municipal liability to make it just like siloed to a police department because say the municipality or the state or whatever that gives them some sort of skin in the game of systemic overall haul for police as opposed to maybe some potential kind of uh, statutory carve out i do think that uh part of the challenge is figuring out where the best pressure points are, where the pressure points are for change. When it comes to who should pay in police misconduct suits, I, I actually don't think it should be the officer. I, I do think that there are, there are statutes like Colorado has experimented with requiring officers who've acted in bad faith to pay a portion of a settlement, $25,000 or 5% of a settlement or judgment. I actually think that's a good idea because it does give the officers some skin in the game while also making sure that the local government is going to be able to fully compensate the person whose rights have been violated. My inclination is that police departments should have the money taken out of their budgets. And remember, police departments' budgets are set during city budget planning process. Right. So it's, it's really money from the city that goes to the police department's budget. Um, but I've spoken to uh, risk managers and officials in some jurisdictions that do this. And they have said that knowing what is being spent and knowing that it's coming from their budget 
does make police departments uh, a little more sensitive to the decisions that they're making. It's still just a small, small percentage of police departments' budgets, um, but they are directly able to make some changes if they choose to reduce the likelihood of future harms. Well, uh, this was so excellent. I can't thank you enough. Joanna Schwartz, professor of law at the UCLA School of Law, author of Shielded, How the Police Became Untouchable. We will put a link uh, to the book in the description, uh, podcast, YouTube, all those good places. Uh, thanks so much, jo uh, Joanna. Really appreciate your time. Thanks for having me. Of course. All right, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we will be joined by Sam Mellons, who will give us the update on Kathy Hochul's judicial fight. Kathy Hochul. That too. We are back and we are joined now by Sam Mellon, senior reporter at New York Focus. Uh, Sam, thanks so much for coming on today. Pleasure to be here. Of course. So um, uh, New York Governor Kathy Hochul, uh, we've been covering this saga a little bit, but for people that don't know, um, it kind of came to a very embarrassing end for New York Governor Kathy Hochul last week. Uh, her much maligned judicial nominee, Hector LaSalle, was struck down by the state Senate. And um, let's start from the beginning for people that might not have been following this. Um, how did this all begin and, and who is this guy, Hector LaSalle? Why was he so controversial? Yeah, so Hector LaSalle was Governor Hochul's nominee to be the chief judge of the Court of Appeals, which is New York's equivalent of the Supreme Court. It's the final word on New York state law. Uh, it's it's uh, seven members who serve for 14 year terms. The previous chief, Janet DeFiore, resigned last summer and Governor Hochul picked LaSalle to replace him. And he uh, generated a historic level of controversy and opposition. No governor's nominee has ever been rejected by the state Senate until now when last week they rejected him uh, by a vote of 39 to 20, I think it was. And, and Let's rewind to that resignation, which I believe was also due to some controversy as well. Um, that that is that essentially uh, that resignation meant that the next chief judge would be the person who breaks a conservative or liberal uh, kind of deadlock. It's there's seven people on the Court of Appeals in New York. Then by because this of this resignation, there was three on each side. So this was incredibly important. Um, and in New York State, there was a history of the former governor, uh, the the disgraced Andrew Cuomo, putting conservative judges on the state Supreme Court to kind of hamstring the progressive wing of his party and also do some favors for people that he knew. Right. Yeah, so cer certainly the first part, I think uh, six of the uh, seven judges who were on the court before the chief resigned were Democrats. But some of them were really quite conservative Democrats. And so one thing we've reported on at New York Focus is how, especially in the last year before the former chief resigned, there was this conservative block of four judges on the court, four judges, seven, seven out of seven, that's a majority. And they really uh, voted together in almost every case that they heard to uh, push the law in a more conservative direction when it came to things like workers' rights or tenants' rights or the rights of criminal defendants, they were much more towards the sides of prosecutors and corporations and landlords and things of that nature. The former chief, uh, Janet DeFiori, who resigned, was part of that block. So her resignation, like you were saying, Emma, really created this critical opening uh, that could, that will have a very big 
part in determining the political direction of the Court of Appeals going forward. So that's, I mean, part of why Hector LaSalle was so controversial, right? He has a sparse history, one that involves being a bit anti-labor, being a bit uh, anti-abortion, and particularly in this moment, when you're a Democratic governor, you are in a Democratic state, you're going to nominate a guy who's got a shady record on abortion? I mean, it's as tone deaf as it gets, and um, that's where the controversy started uh and and the progressive wing in the state senate kind of uh led that opposition so so let's uh go to that point um you know right before he was brought in front of the the judiciary committee yeah and one thing i think it's important to mention is that the, the some of the most progressive senators were the first to say that they would oppose him with, within hours of when the governor nominated him in december but it was not at all just progressives who opposed LaSalle's confirmation. One of the senators who said that she would oppose him uh, before the Judiciary Committee hearing, and she's on the Judiciary Committee, is Senator Shelley Mayer, who re represents parts of Westchester, is sort of a, a very mainstream Democrat, or uh, Senator Michelle Hinchy in the Hudson Valley, also a very mainstream Democrat. You know, unions that are sort of very much within the mainstream of the Democratic Party also came out against him because of uh, one, in one, one particular ruling where he allowed a corporation to sue union leaders. The National Organization of Women, which, you know, not some far left feminist group, uh, opposed his nomination over concerns about his uh, record on reproductive rights. So this was not at all, sort of, you know, progressives torpedoing a moderate governor's nomination. This was really an effort by a broad swath of the Democratic Party, certainly including progressives, but not exclusively to sink this nomination. Right. And so then we're in there's in there's the, the committee vote. Right. Um, it gets shot down 10 to 9 in the Judiciary Committee in the state Senate. Then Hochul threatens to sue and the state Republicans as well. What the hell happened there? Right. So. Generally, the procedure is that the Senate, the Senate has the power to confirm or reject an appointment. The Senate Judiciary Committee hears it first, and they decide whether or not to recommend it to the full Senate, and then the full Senate decides whether or not to approve it. Um, the Senate Judiciary Committee in January, about a month after he was nominated, had a five-hour hearing in Albany. I was there. It was certainly very long, uh, with many, many questions asked, uh, and they voted 10 to 9, not to recommend his appointment. Uh, 10 Democrats voted against, uh, I think three, no, two Democrats voted in favor, and then six Republicans, all of the Republicans on the committee, and one Democrat voted to say, we recommend that this go to the full Senate, but we're not voting in favor of the nomination. So sort of a hedging mm -hmm. your bets there. Right. Um, but since a majority of the committee had voted against, the Senate Democrats, including the majority leader, Andrea Stewart-Cousins, said, that's it, the nomination is dead. We don't, we don't have to send this to the full Senate because the committee voted against. Uh, Hochul and some other experts, including uh, former chief judge of the Court of Appeals, not the one who resigned, the one before her, uh, said, no, that's not right. The Constitution says the full Senate has to vote. I think it's kind of vague. I think there's good arguments on both sides. Um, Hochul threatened to sue the Senate to force them to vote on it. Uh, in the end, she didn't get to whether or not she would have because one of the Republican senators on the Judiciary Committee sued the Senate. And but then maybe to head off that lawsuit a week after he sued the Senate Democrats, they said, OK, you want us you want the full Senate to vote? Fine, we'll vote. And they sent him down by a very wide margin. Yeah. So that's the end, like death knell uh, in in this whole saga for Hochul. Right. It was a huge, huge failure. Uh, that vote, I, I t the the full Senate vote shot him down decisively. And what there were only there was only one Democrat that voted in favor, and the other ones that were kind of on Hochul's side were coincidentally on vacation. Yeah, it was it was certainly no accident that the vote was scheduled for when some of LaSalle's biggest supporters in the Democratic Party were not in town. One of them was out of the country. That was, I'm sure that was intentional on the part of Senate leadership. Hochul herself was in New York City, not in Albany to 
do any arm twisting that she might have. Not that I think it would have made a difference. So that was a very carefully chosen moment for sure. Um, but yeah, after that vote, it's uh, there's now no dispute. He his nomination has been rejected. The the process to replace uh, the former chief has to start again. And yeah, it's certainly I I think easily the most significant defeat from the governor uh, for the governor in her time in office so far, and all, all the more so because it, it was overwhelmingly members of her own party that rejected this nominee. The Republicans actually voted for him with with one or two exceptions. So, I mean, now this is, I'm, I'm asking you to editorialize maybe, uh, or also just see uh, if, if uh, you guys at New York Focus have any intel on this. What was she thinking? I mean, what, why this commitment especially after it was an underwhelming election for her. I mean, she only beat Lee Zeldin by what, five points or so, Bradley? Five points. Um, and it was just not a mandate by any means. And on the federal, on the national level, many were blaming New York State for the Democrats losing the House, uh, in part due to her being on top of the ticket. She was not an inspiring candidate. Then she turns around and is bullish about a conservative judge when Biden on the national level is making it a priority to stack the judiciary uh, in order to to stave off far right ex uh, extremist judges and rulings um, and abortion is the number one issue for most Democratic voters in the country uh, or one of the top issues, given Roe v. Wade being overturned. And we're in the, this moment of uh, labor or seven percent. Sorry. Uh, in this moment of, of labor uh, reckoning nationally so it just seems like there are about four or five factors that should tell her no what was this relationship with her and hector lasalle what was the motivating factor yeah that's sort of the million dollar question and there's no certainly no evidence of any sort of you know corruption or shady dealings or anything that that's no 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 one has suggested that that's, that was something in play. So I want to rule that out. Um, I think one thing is that uh, Hector LaSalle, obviously very qualified in terms of his resume, also uh, uh, Latino, and Hochul has faced a lot of criticism for not appointing enough Latino uh, individuals to positions of power in her administration. So that was an opportunity to head off some of that criticism. Um, I think if you look at uh, Governor Hochul's record in government since she was in local government in the Buffalo area, this, in a way, in a certain way, is consistent with her political values. She's generally been a moderate. You know, uh, she had uh, support from some generally right-wing groups when she served as a Democrat in Congress. Uh, it's not humongously out of character for her in terms of the political commitments that she's demonstrated over decades in public service. But I think the really surprising part to many observers is just sort of the lack of, of groundwork before this nomination. Like, you know, how hard is it to, to call the major unions and say, hey, are, are you cool with this guy? To call, you know, the majority leader of the state Senate who wields tremendous power among the Democrats and say, hey, is this good with you? Which historically it has been, but there's been reporting, we've reported and other people have reported that there was just a lot of that groundwork that didn't happen, which I think led to her administration really being caught off guard by the backlash to this nomination. It, any uh, any idea who's who's the next up? I mean, is she gonna double down on center right candidates, or is she gonna maybe kind of uh, capitulate a little bit to to progressives and and just her party? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I really do not know the answer, but I promise you we will be looking at it very closely. We'll be following along. Um, it's, yeah, she could pick a, a candidate in a similar mold. She has to pick from a short list that a certain panel sends to her, the Commission on Judicial Nominations, nomination it's called. So her choices are limited by that, but they generally select a sort of range of candidates. So she could pick a candidate in a similar mold and dare the Senate to reject him or her again, or she could pick, and I don't think, I don't, I think many of the senators who rejected LaSalle, they're not looking for some, you know, uh, far left, like socialists, whatever, despite what uh, some uh, right-wing media outlets might have you believe. I think 
many of the senators would be happy. So some senators certainly are looking for that, but many of the senators would be happy with someone who's sort of a liberal in the mainstream of the Biden era Democratic Party. So she, I think if she nominated someone along those lines, they would get through with no problem. But maybe she wants to, uh, you know, play hardball again. We'll have to see. My God. All right. Well, uh, yeah, her, her political acumen is it leaves a lot to be desired, in my opinion. But uh, Sam Mellon, senior reporter at New York Focus, thanks for your time today and, and breaking down this whole bizarre moment uh, in New York politics. Great to talk to you, Emma. Thanks. Thanks. All right, guys. Well, with that, we are going to wrap up the first hour of this program, the free part of the show and head into the fun half. Um, you can become a member at jointhemajorityreport.com. That would be very nice. I would thank you kindly. Um, Matt, what's happening on Left Reckoning tonight? Whoa. Uh, yeah, well, hey. hello, everybody. <laughs> um, Left Reckoning. And he dropped his keys. Fell. Um, Left Reckoning <laughs> on Sunday, uh, um, uh, we talked to Carl Bayer about both the Asai Hurst stuff. We get into uh, his, I believe, um, uh, imminently um responsible digestion of that i think important story that isn't actually isn't getting enough coverage uh as well as talk about the supposed uh anti-war rally and how it surprisingly pro-war and i don't know if we're gonna get the door thing today but i think we should maybe save it for thursday because i think it would be fun but the idea that these guys are the firefighters of uh stopping wars and you should look past uh them if they like are anti-lgbt or something like that like um uh, that that's true. If like some firefighters show up to your house saying, "Actually, let's let this fire burn because it's denazifying this house." Mm. Um, so uh, anyway, sorry to get off on a sidetrack. Uh, tonight, Heather Mendick, uh, activist and former Labor member, joins David and I to talk about the expulsion of Corbyn from the party and the uh, and Keir Summers' continued attack on the Corbyn wing. Uh, not looking good over there. It's sort of like if. Uh, this isn't a perfect comparison. We get over why, but like when the all about uh, when Ilhan said all about the Benjamins, mm -hmm. if it, what happened after that was all of us were like told to leave and not even um try to work within the if Democratic that was successful, yeah, yeah, right. Um, so um, we'll talk we'll talk to about that, which you know, this uh, this conflation of criticism of Israel with uh, anti Semitism is is out of control but anyway right. we'll we get into that uh, patreon.com so left reckoning tonight this is the last time we're doing it at eight eastern it's going to be moving to seven eastern after that wow all right um well uh on esvn yesterday we spoke about carl malone we talked about daniel jones's contract we talked about eric b enemy leaving the uh super bowl champion chiefs because he can't get hired as a head coach uh because he's black to have to go to the washington commanders in a lateral move um it's just uh, it's pretty embarrassing um among many other uh fun topics over there and i did some hockey talk and why i hate patrick kane so much check that out uh, youtube.com slash esvn show and if you're in wisconsin it's today primary voting for the supreme court go vote for uh transvestite from transylvania says judge Pratis Pr Pratasiewicz to protect abortion rights and abolish the GOP gerrymander. So, uh, reminder, go do that today if you're in Wisconsin. All right, 646-257-3920. See you in the fun half. You right. are in for it. All right, folks, 646-257-3920. See you in the fun half. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Are you ready? Who sent us this? Anarchy. Alpha males are back, 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 boy is back, and the alpha males are back, back, just as delicious as you could imagine. The alpha males are back, 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 boy is back, and the alpha males are back, 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 back. Just wanna degrade the white man. Alpha males are back, back. I take all of it to my throat. Alpha males are back, back. Snowflakes says what? The alpha males are back, 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 back. You are a madman! And the alpha males are back, back. Oh no, Sam Cedar, what a, wow, what a fucking nightmare. What a fucking nightmare. nightmare. Bring back DJ yeah, or a couple of them, just put them in rotation. DJ Denner. Well, the problem with those is they're like 45 seconds long, so I don't know if they're enough for the break. Oh, yeah.
That's fucking nonsense.